Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day three, our final day of NFG's National Convening uh, Connections. My name is Aaron Tanaka. I use he and pronouns. I'm the director of the Center for Economic Democracy based in Boston. I've been on the NFG board since 2018 and have the honor of serving as your board treasurer. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so I just wanted to be really real with y'all. Um, I was actually not super excited about coming here. Um, not because I don't love NFG, but um, you know, to be real, I've had a pretty tough couple of years to put it mildly with me and my family. And um, we've also had a terrifying global pandemic. Um, and so it's really left me in a place where um, I've been in completely internal. I haven't been to a conference since 2019. Uh, I'm a extreme introvert, and so I've basically been on a no new friends zone for a few years. Um, but dang y'all, this has been amazing. It's really helped fill me up. Um, just like feeling the warmth of the place. Um, thank you. Feeling the history of where we are, getting to hug old friends, uh, getting to make hopefully some new ones. Um, it's a special situation that we have, and it, it really kind of made me remember why we talk about NFG as a political home. It feels comfortable. It feels real. Um, and I hope that, you know, whether you're a uh, NFG OG veteran or it's your first time here, you're getting a little bit of that taste of home. Um, we really need it. We have so much work ahead of us, and we all need places to come home to ourselves. So as we wrap up the final day, I just want to, um, well, I'm going to bring up Amy in a second to introduce this very uh, exciting, brilliant, very lovely panel that we have coming, highly anticipated, uh, called Shifting Philanthropic Culture to Support Progressive Movements Towards Liberation and Self-Determination. Uh, rolls off the tongue. Let's go. <laughs> um, so in this conversation, one of the uh, critical themes is going to be about building stronger more resilient organizations that are able to meet this political moment. And so before I go, I just want to take this opportunity to lift up some of the work that NFG has been doing internally uh, to make our organization more resilient and aligned. And specifically, I want to uplift um, our staff and specifically our staff union, as well as our management team, uh, helping turn NFG, this historic essential organization, into a unionized workplace with its first bargain contract. It's incredible work. We're so grateful and proud for the integrity and nuance that people are bringing to this process. We're going to have a lot to learn through and afterwards. But I really just want to say to the NFG staff, um, each and every single one of you are a delight. You're freaking brilliant. Uh, it's a badass team. And I just want to thank you for your heartfelt work, the exhaustive work uh, to bring all of us together so that we could come home together. Thank you. Hey everybody, one last time, I'm Amy Morris. It's great to see you all here. Um, I'm currently serving as NFG's interim president. I hope you all had a great, well, I hope you've had a great week and that you had a wonderful morning being in concurrent sessions. Um, and I'm excited to welcome you alongside Aaron to our final plenary. Um, I think that over the course of this week, the thing that's felt the most exciting to me, apart from seeing everybody and being in space together, is to think about like the threads, the conversations that have been sparked that NFG can offer a space to carry forward. So conversations like the call to, to fund and continue funding in under-resourced and underfunded areas of the country like Eastern North Carolina, the really honest and vulnerable conversations that cracked open in the funder organizing training around race and gender in our sector, and the conversation that was happening around the, impl the potential implications uh, that will come from the decisions made by the Supreme Court in the coming months for our sector, for philanthropy in particular. Um, and I think, you know, the, the way in which we want to move with you all as our members and continue to hold space and be with alongside you in those conversations is what I'm really taking away from this week. 
Um, as I said, this convening, as I said on day one, this convening has been a kind of a major milestone for us coming out of the pandemic. Um, and I'm hopeful that when we see you again at the next NFG convening, we'll have new leadership. As I said on day one, maybe you're in this room. Um, and that we'll have grown our membership to more folks moving with us to move money to racial, economic, gender, and climate justice. But before we go, so we have this last conversation, which I think is a really, really critical one. Um, this, the idea for having this plenary at this convening as our final plenary really grew out of uh, our kind of looking at the moment that we're in as an organization as NFG and the way in which what we're experiencing internally as an organization is so similar to the conversations that we're all in out in these spaces uh, in movement and in philanthropy um, and wanted to really lift that up and bring it to the main stage in the context of being honest also about where we are as an organization. So um, the conversation this morning uh, is going to be based on kind of drawing from two pieces of work. Many of you have probably read Maurice Mitchell's 2022 article titled Building Resilient Organizations. And I'm sure a lot of you have also seen an article, that, uh, a report that came out in 2023 called Beyond Neutrality, looking at the challenges and opportunities of unionizing in the social justice sector. These two pieces together for us as a staff have felt really resonant and really alive. So we're gonna bring the themes of those pieces of work together with their authors and other folks who are engaged in these conversations with us to the stage this morning. Um, and what I wanna challenge before I bring them up, what I just wanna say about this is, this is a room full of funders. And I think that we need to ask ourselves how can our work as funders, as grant makers, as partners to the organizations that we support really best support organizations facing all of the challenges and opportunities of this political moment? And so I hope that you can listen to the conversation and the ideas that are put out this morning really with that like action frame. What does this mean for me about how I do my work? So I'm totally thrilled to invite our speakers up on stage. You can all come on up. I'll just say as they make their way, um, our moderator this morning is going to be Sarita Gupta, the Vice President of Programs at the Ford Foundation. She's been a key collaborator in the development of the Beyond Neutrality Report and was very supportive in kind of the scaffolding and pushing out the message in the Building Resilient Organizations article. Maurice Mitchell, the Executive Director of the Working Families Party and author of this article, Building Resilient Organizations, that was published in The Forge, in Nonprofit Quarterly, and Convergence Magazine. And they'll both give some opening remarks and then join in conversation with two other folks, our very own Nicole Washington, who is operations manager of NFG's Amplify Fund and a member of the NFG staff union represented by CWA Local 9415. And Amy Smucha um, from Listening Tree Consulting, one of the co-authors of the Beyond Neutrality Report, who has been an incredible support to our senior management team and so many other organizations that are moving through the process of organizing, of unionizing, leading with their values. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarita to take us away. Thanks everyone. All right, a couple of adjustments. Oh, there we go, better. Okay, good morning. So first of all, thank you, Amy, so much for that introduction and really for making space at this convening for such an important conversation. Um, I also want to take this moment to acknowledge Manisha Vaze, who has, yes, we should clap, who has worked tirelessly to lead funders for a just economy and really along with Amy has been an incredible thought partner on this session in particular. And it's really terrific to be here with all of you. Um, I'm happy to be with you all you know, here today. And I have to say, um, for me, this is my first time coming to an N NFG convening as a funder. So it's really great to be in this space with all of you. And I'm thrilled to get to moderate this conversation about how funders can support movement and social justice organizations that are organizing and democratizing their workplaces through unionization efforts and collective bargaining. We have an incredible lineup, as Amy shared. Um, our speakers will discuss the opportunities, 
um, these efforts have to strengthen movement organizations, deepen their capacity to build power and actualize their visions and purpose. They will also discuss the underlying tensions that it can exist as organizations recognize a staff union and bargain a first contract. And together, we will explore these dynamics and how funders can support progressive movement infrastructure as they work towards worker and racial justice within their own institutions. But before we zoom in on the social justice sector, I do want to provide a bit of context for this conversation, larger context. Union organizing campaigns and unionization drives have been on the rise across every industry, including nonprofits and social justice organizations. This drive mirrors much of what we've seen in the private sector, compounding economic environmental, social, and political volatility are causing workers to reevaluate their relationships to work and are demanding and negotiating with leaders for change. As someone who's dedicated much of my adult life so far to the worker and economic justice field, I have to say it's a really exciting time. From Striketober in 2021 to the present, workers across the economy have been organizing and taking collective action. October 2021 became known as Striketober because during that month alone, over 100,000 workers were either on strike or preparing to strike. And these were workers from various backgrounds, including manufacturing, filmmaking, healthcare, and fast food. And as we know, strikes are still happening today. You know, if we just do a massive shout out to the Writers Guild, um, folks are following that. And Manisha, if you haven't noticed, is wearing the Writers Guild t-shirt. Um, but in addition to the strikes, there has also been an incredible uptick in organizing. Um, a recently, a, a close grantee partner said to me, quote, Bar baristas are organizing at Starbucks, Gamers are organizing at Microsoft. Geniuses are organizing at Apple. Baristas, gamers, and geniuses, those are words I never thought I would say together. So, and we've been all watching the Amazon workers as they've been in motion trying to organize, uh, to digital workers at the New York Times, to graduate students, and of course, essential workers. And public support is on the rise for unions and is at a decades long high point. And all of this is good and all of this matters given the state of our democracy today. Unions and the right of workers to organize are essential to democracy because democracy is about the ability for people to govern over aspects of their lives. Often when we think about democracy, we think only about political democracy and democratic participation in the form of voting, lobbying, policy, and legal work. Yet collective bargaining, both at work and in communities, applies democratic practices to the economic relationships, the many ways in which people interact with the economy every day. Democracy at work is sometimes the entry point for many people in engaging in ongoing democratic participation in their lives. And in fact, this is how we build the muscle, right, for habits of democracy in our society. And if you think about it, work is actually a great place for people to build this muscle given the sheer number of hours that people spend at work, right? So collective bargaining and unions are fundamental to democracy, and a strong labor movement has historically seeded the groundwork for stronger social justice movements, creating better outcomes for all. And in the context of today's discussion, their continued growth can reshape the relationship between nonprofit workers, leaders, and organizations. A little over a year ago, many of us at Ford Foundation knew that many of our grantees and organizations across the field were really struggling with staff unionization, and especially BIPOC leaders, and in some cases, new leaders, women of color leaders who are reaching out and saying, I just stepped into leadership and into a new role, and suddenly in week two, the staff has unionized and come to me for recognition, 
what do I do, right? And how do I not take this personally? And why am I being expected to fix all the problems, right? So we're talking about grantee partners who are leading key social justice efforts and in some cases driving big vision and wins. And this progress is happening because of the work of building powerful organizations. Therefore, it's no surprise that then that those organizations in the movement are struggling with the same broader dynamics and questions playing out in society as a whole, right? I believe we are in a moment of real culture change in our society as people rethink their relationship to work. Think about it for a minute, all of you. You're in the middle of the pandemic two years ago. How many of you actually sat and reflected on how you think about work and the way you work? I'd be surprised if anyone said they didn't have a moment of reflection on that. I know I did. And so just to say that workers, in fact, are asking themselves the purpose of work in their lives. And what comes up, of course, are questions about wages and salaries and benefits and flex time, childcare, elder care, paid leave, sick days, travel, remote work versus hybrid versus in-person work. And of course, a voice in shaping those very policies and practices. And so at Ford, we knew we needed, to, we needed help figuring out how to best support movement and leaders right now. We also recognize there were informal ways in which movement leaders are trying to navigate this. Many of us and many people on the stage, in fact, were getting phone calls from people saying, what do we do? What do we do? Who do I call? My staff just said they want to have a union. What do I do? So we reached out at Ford to Amy Smucha um, and Deb Axt, from Make the Road, who was formerly with Make the Road, um, to do a deep dive assessment and help us understand what's going on and what can be done um, to help it go better. And in fact, I'll let Amy talk when we get into the panel about some of the methodologies they use and the interviews they did and how we've brought in other consultants in the process. Um, but the point I want to say is we have this incredible report, the Beyond Neutrality Report, which you all have access to. So I just want to close by sharing just a few top line learnings from the report, which we'll get into in much more depth um, in the, on the panel. Unionization is a disruption that seeds positive change within organizations, but may present large challenges for leadership. Too few nonprofits have the experience and resources to facilitate collective bargaining in a way that is pro-union and aligns with their values for worker and racial justice. There's a lack of pro-union consultants, lawyers, human resource professionals, and more who can effectively support organizations through this process. And within the social justice sector, successful unionization drives will require charitable assumptions between management and labor, from recognition through collective bargaining and the implementation of an agreement. We have to center justice and equity throughout the process, particularly for BIPOC leaders and staff, while increasing the capacity and body of research and materials available to labor and management so they can do so effectively. So that's just a little bit of a, a teaser for you to know what, was, what you'll find in the report. And again, in the panel, we'll get into more details. And as Amy mentioned, this report came out alongside this amazing, brilliant article that was written by Maurice Mitchell. And so we're so, so lucky to have Maurice with us this morning, who's going to provide some more context around building resilient organizations and movements. So without further ado, Maurice, come on up. Thank you so much, Sarita. And I wrote this down. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to quote this: "Baristas, gamers, and geniuses." Yeah, I like it. Uh, hey, y'all. Good morning. I want to do that again. Good morning. All right. Um, I'm Maurice Mitchell. I'm the national director of the Working Families Party. It's a real pleasure 
to be here with you all. And I also see some of my, uh, when I was like on the ground organizing, I see some of my comrades from my, I see Marjana, I see, uh, who else? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I see Miss Rivera over there from Citizen Action of New York. Um, who else, who else is in? All my New York fam, I'm not gonna name all of you, but I love you all. Um, yeah, and so I also wanna thank the staff and uh, the committee and planning leads at NFG, Amy, Chi, Tiana, uh, Manisha, uh, Courtney, and also my fellow panelists, thank you so much. Uh, now, I wanna take you all back uh, to the summer of 2020. Uh, now, do you all remember where you were um, when you either heard above or you actually witnessed virtually the hideous murder of George Floyd? Do you all remember? Okay, well, I certainly do. I remember. As someone who's dedicated his life to defending Black life and building independent political power to ensure Black people can thrive in this country, this moment hit me to the core on an embodied personal level, on a political level, on a movement level. And I, I knew instinctively as an institutional leader commanding a political vehicle that it was my duty to move my people and my organization into action. And from June 2020 through November, the election, WP really threw down with everything we had. And we worked to become an electoral arm of the movement. And we recruited tens of thousands of newly activated people into direct action, mobilization, and civic engagement. 26 million people hit the streets. It's the largest social movement in our country's history. And what resulted was a massive organizing effort to approximately defeat the Christian white nationalist wave that Trump wrote to the White House, but also try to wrestle with 400 years of dispossession, slavery, settler colonialism. And we brought movement energy into elections, which is really hard to do. Uh, but that happened and we created an electoral united front that ultimately helped to defeat Trump and to make him the first one term president in the last 30 years. And on top of everything, we scaled during a pandemic. We're, we're still in this pandemic, although, you know, folks want to pretend that we're not, but folks here understand that because I see a lot of masks. So we as an organization scale dramatically, many of your grantees scale dramatically. Um, then we experienced what I call a political hangover. The contradictions came to an head, right? Uh, after the scaling of new staff and after this tremendous political moment and the scaling of infrastructure, when many of us could not physically be with one another, we saw our coalitions, internal systems and relationships fraying. Does anybody, can anybody identify with this? Yeah? As we rapidly grew, we also rapidly accelerated existing contradictions and conflict. And what I first thought were interpersonal issues between organizers and supervisors, I soon recognized and realized were the acute downstream impacts of bigger issues, of structural issues, right? From what I talked about, the pandemic that all of us experience all around the world to the, the structural sort of implications of us after 40 years of neoliberalism to the realities of living under neoliberal capitalism, white supremacy and patriarchy. And then some of the more specific issues that we're dealing in this po political moment, all of them. And also some of the issues around labor po uh, power that Sarita referenced. Now, Coming out of that, another thing I recognize is that this is a moment of reflection. And coming out of that political and emotional sort of backwash, um, I had to reflect. I had to understand what was going on. And that reflection became my article, Building Resilient Organizations. And it helped me sort of narrow down on the importance of a strategic North Star. 
And so let me get in the, can I get into the article? All right, let me, let me do that. And uh, so I began writing first in an effort to handle the conflicts and contradictions that were in my midst uh, as a leader at the Working Families Party. But when I started talking to other leaders who are similarly situated, other executive directors or other movement leaders, I began to hear our stories begin to rhyme. Does anybody else have that experience? Yeah? Okay. Now, folks that I talked to kind of encouraged me and organized me to begin to put my thoughts into a format that wouldn't just be useful for my personal notes. And I, I have to thank all of my comrades who were real contributors to this by challenging me to, to continue to sharpen this piece and helping me to think through this. And also I'd like to thank our staff union who weighed in as well as I got towards the end. So props to WFP staff union. Let's give it up for union organizations. So show of hands, how many, how, how many of you have read this article, Building Resilient Organizations? Okay, a significant number of you. So thank you so much. I'm so happy that the article is actually doing work in the world. Um, but if you haven't, you could, you could, with your phone, you could text NFG to 30403 and like that through the magic of technology, the article will appear on your phone. So you could do that and then you could read it on your way back home. Again, NFG to 30403. Now, I wanna give away the ending up front. Building resilient organizations is not a management guide. Building resilient organizations is an alarm. We don't need to build resilient organizations solely for the sake of having functional workspaces, though that is a worthy goal in and of itself. We need to build resilient organizations so we have the capacity to fight and to defeat the rising tide of fascism, threatening to overtake our government, our world, and to literally kill many of our most vulnerable, vulnerable people in our communities in the process. It is a guide to fighting fascism. Uh, that's why I felt the urgency to write it. Now, so in 2021, when our political hangover started to hit, as a leader, I had to start getting curious about what was happening internally. And I, I discovered that our managers and organizers were having very different experiences. The lifelong organizer in me identified with what I saw in the field. And what I heard in the organizers in the field was a sincere desire to do their jobs well and to build power for their communities. When I talked to managers putting together plans, I also saw hardworking people struggling to figure things out. There were no heroes or villains. These were all good people trying their level best to do the work and getting into conflict along the way. Not because managers wanted to be mean or that organizers weren't going hard in the field, but because something wasn't working. The organizer manager split wasn't stark enough to cause WP to rupture, but if I didn't lean into it, I was sure conflict would grow and eventually lead to rupture. What starts as good faith people struggling can turn into resentment and harden into cynicism. And once that cynicism hardens into bad faith, things feel almost intractable and impossible. Anybody witness that and could feel that? So as leaders, we know a crisis is an all hands on deck moment, but I decided to put the urgency of crisis into dealing with our issues before they formed into a crisis. That was part of the genesis of this paper. As I wrote, I began to discern how in organizations, so many things are buried under the day-to-day -day assumptions of the work. We travel in the implicit, we almost have to. We can't re reaffirm every single detail every, sign, every time we bring it up. And as we travel in the, in the implicit, we're led by assumptions that create the conditions for conflict and misalignment. One of the joys of organizational life is that our organizations draw on and often cater to so many different types of people with their own hopes, dreams, and visions for what we should be. One of the complications of organizational life is that our organizations draw on and often cater to so many different types of people with their own hopes, dreams, and visions of what we should be, right? With all that difference, you need a through line. You need a North Star. You need a strategically clear vision and communicate it. After formalizing processes and recognizing fault lines, we had to communicate who we were to our staff and our governing bodies. Some people thought our job was to win elections. Others thought we, that we should be doing mutual aid. 
And based on someone's experiences with the organization or their onboarding processes, both could be right at the same time. However, if people with drastically diverging views about who and what, for example, WFP was, were placed in a space of collaboration, conflict was all but inevitable. As leaders and managers, it's our responsibility to make sure the people in our midst understand the organization's charge. The root of our conflict is often a general lack of clarity about what we do and how we do it as well as the broader time, place, and conditions. And it's my job at WFP and your job as funders to create that clarity if it's lacking and to continuously affirm it once the mission is clear. Now, when I started having these conversations at WFP, some were unclear about what we were as an institution or the point of the work long-term. Beyond the immediate electoral cycle, they weren't entirely sure where we were going. I also found that some were clear on the big picture ideas, ending racism or changing society through electoral politics, but couldn't tell you how we should do that or, or were wrestling with competing visions about getting there. Today, our North Star is clear. The Working Families Party is here to build governing power for working people. You can fit that on a tweet. You can say that in a one floor elevator ride. It's who we are, it's what we are. We fluently could communicate that across the organization. It's not at the level of assumption, it's not implied, it's explicit. Now, we couldn't build a national infrastructure to build governing power for working people without everyone being on the same page. That reality isn't WP centric, it's movement wide. There is no way you can build a local state or national infrastructure without everyone being clear about the North Star. And there is no way to properly fund this fight without incoherence and confusion either. Us as leaders tolerating incoherence is us tolerating leaving power out of reach, power on the table at a time when rising fascism is literally killing our people. We cannot do that. We cannot tolerate strategic incoherence. Um, now, for too long, many of our organizations across the country have tolerated this. You talk to one person, they'll say, we're a revolutionary organization. And another will say, we're a service organization. Someone will say, we do direct action. And it's the same organization. Anybody identify with that? OK. Trying to be all things to all people guarantees will be nothing effective to anyone and will likely have no impact. This is a room full of funders. I have to tell you that investing in clarity is expensive. I could use our example. To build that North Star clarity at WFP, um, it costs close to $1 million in staff time and in consultants, right? But every dollar was a dollar well spent, and the return on, invest on investment far exceeds the capital put into making it happen. But it's a real investment, and it wasn't something that was funded. It was an unfunded mandate. I am inviting each and every one of you to get clear on your mission to support your grantees to do so and to use that mission to boldly reimagine the future. If you take nothing else from this today, please remember there is no predetermined outcome. The future, like our politics, is constructed. Remember this, in November 2008, following the election, very educated, nice people were engaging in discourse about the end of racism. I don't know if you remember that. I remember that. Like, serious people that people pay to write stuff, wrote about the end of racism. And in the years following, fringe people, people at the very fringes of the right wing, like Steve Bannon and Steve Miller, constructed politics that have become our reality. The politics of Trump, of CRT, of QAnon, of Bannon's economic nationalism. The future is not predetermined. The future and our politics are constructed. So the only question is, who will be the protagonist in this next era in a country that is clearly at a crossroads? That's for all of us here to decide. It requires a level of clarity, a level of confidence, a level of coherence that is uniquely the job of people in this room. If we don't wanna play the role of coffee shop liberal, number one in Steve Bannon's next political drama, that will require us all to take seriously the messages in my article as a guide to fight fascism. If we can do that and get clear on our missions, get clear on our ideological focus on our emotional lives of our organization and ourselves, of our strategic through line, we'll build more sustainable organizations and a more just and sustainable world. 
And that's ultimately, I believe, how we get free. Thank you. Wow, that was terrific. Thank you so much, Maurice. Um, and I think it was just the grounding we needed for this discussion that we're about to embark on. So I want to bring Amy and Nicole into this conversation um, that we have begun. Um, and Amy, welcome. I want to start with you, actually. Um, I'd love to hear more about, I, I touched a little bit on the top line findings of the Beyond Neutrality Report, but I'd love for you to get a little granular with us. Tell us what you learned, what you observed, what you saw, uh, and how this relates back to what Maurice was just talking about. Awesome. Thank you, Sarita. Um, I just want to also say it's so wonderful to be here. This is also my first NFG conference, and I've learned a lot. Um, it gives me great hope to see where philanthropy is going through the leadership of folks in this room. And thank you, Maurice, for really this article that has set a fire on the movement to think about what is what does it mean to build resilient organizations so we can um, not only fight fa fascism, but really like change our democracy, right? Um, so I'm super excited to be here talking about the Beyond Neutrality Project, and I wanted to give you a little sense of how we studied the field, so what we learned really from movement leaders about how they're experiencing staff unionization, the innovations they're making. I also want to talk a little bit about um, what are the recommendations that we've come up with about how to help this really go better, how to innovate the model in the nonprofit world so that we build stronger organizations um, and we change effectively the outcomes of unionization and also the positive impacts of unionization on organizations. Um, but before I go into the nitty gritty, I just want to ask, if you are in this room and you have been close to an organization, inside the organization leading it, um, a funder who really is a thought partner with an organization, maybe a volunteer or board member who experienced unionization in the last, let's say, five years, raise your hand. So if you know of folks, right? And if at that moment you and the people around you found yourselves right in your body and your spirit having some conflicting feelings about whether this is a good thing, whether it would go well, whether it could potentially stall the organization out. So you had a lot of conflicting feelings about it uh, or the people around you did, raise your hands. So actually fewer, fewer than I think I actually experience in the field. And I just wanna ground us in sort of the fact that unionization is laden with a lot of cultural constructs, right? good bosses demanding employees, right? This process is going to take a long time. So we have a lot of beliefs and mindsets that really come out of how unions have had to deal with um, capitalist extractive white supremacist organizations um, that still live within our sense of unions, especially when our staff members are coming um, to us asking for voluntary recognition or letting us know there's gonna be an election. And so the Beyond Neutrality Report and Now Project was really an exploration of of that, of that inherent tension of how it's actually going, and more importantly, how we can make it go better. So just a couple of things. Um, we interviewed well over um, 60 folks for the report. Most of them were senior leaders in nonprofit organizations, often EDs, COOs, um, many folks in operations and HR. We also talked to um, some folks who are in unions, who are especially organizing the nonprofit sector, and practitioners such as mediators, um, attorneys, other folks who are really paying attention to it. And we did find the three things um, that Sarita mentioned, and that's that unionization um, is a disruption. And disruption, I use that as a neutral term. So it causes both challenges, but also seeds really positive change within organizations. We also found, and this is sort of the big one in terms of what could go better, that um, although not all nonprofits, you know, are pro-union and welcome staff unions, in the movement sector, in general, people had a genuine desire to accept, welcome, and um, learn through the unionization process, but there was an incredible dearth of resources. You literally cannot Google 
you know, staff union voluntary recognition and find almost anything other than union busting and anti-union materials, right? How to deter your how to deter your staff from making this choice, what you can say to them, and every example of what you can say is, you know, the what you'll lose from getting a union, right? Um, and so there really was no guidepost, no resources um, for managers and 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 leaders who needed to figure out how to innovate within this model. Um, and then lastly, um, unionization is both um, uh, championing and also impeding racial justice ambitions and goals, and also goals around equity and inclusion. And the thing about that is really important in that there is a whole bunch of questions that are being opened up about how collective bargaining can potentially advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and racial justice goals and objectives. Um, there's also the challenge that some of those things come to a halt when unionization happens because you have some real legal constraints about what sorts of internal processes can move forward outside of the bargaining process. And then there's the really big one that both uh, Sarita um, alluded to, and that's that many times the leaders of organizations who experience unionization are BIPOC leaders, women leaders, queer leaders, immigrant leaders who are in roles for the first time. And the experience of unionization as it has evolved in the capitalist extractive context um, feels like white supremacy coming at folks, right? Like that is just very real. Um, and so what we did with the report was sort of study and gather that learning. And the report and all the work we're doing now is really an aggregate of what people in the field are learning, doing, trying, um, and trying to create real alternatives. Um, so I wanna say one more thing about the recommendations yes. for the report. What we're doing now, and um, Deb Axt, who was former co-director of Make the Road New York and I, did the original assessment. We then quadded up with Kim Freeman Brown, who is a consultant who focuses a lot on many things, including black leadership and diversity, equity, inclusion, and Allison Porter. Um, Kim and Allison are now with a firm called Imagine Us. So we quadded up to think through like what could we actually do to help the field with these innovations, experiments, and shifts. And um, we'll talk more about all sorts of things, uh, but I just wanna say in general, there are four things that we're advancing. And right now we're in the process of trying to shape and resource those things. One is to create a real foundation about how unionization and collective bargaining can be um, advanced within movement organizations um, with a real equity and racial justice lens um, and tools and the ability to have like the self-reflection about how race and gender and other um, things are showing up in the process. So we're going to convene um, what we're calling a wisdom circle um, based on feedback we've gotten from the field of folks who could really help think through how are we gonna talk about and uh, make sure we're addressing especially racial justice um, and centering racial justice in these innovations. The second thing is just simply a resource hub. So while when you Google staff unionization nonprofits, um, in six months, you will find a plethora of materials that help people understand how to voluntarily recognize your damn union, right? Um, help people understand how to think about the bargaining unit, help people think about under, uh, how to approach collective bargaining from a collaborative perspective that also really values unions as powerful partners within our workplaces, right? So we're going to be cr creating those materials. And we're also um, launching a sort of a learning lab where we want to expand the number of consultants and attorneys who are pro-union and pro-worker um, who are able to walk alongside organizations. Yes. Um, so a learning lab will allow us to train folks to do this well um, and create more consultants and more attorneys. And also organizations will get that support and assistance in real time. And then um, lastly, in the long haul, this will come a little later, we want to form a labor management network uh, with um, some third party neutrals like Cornell University. Um, and this will be a place for unions who are organizing in this world and nonprofit leaders who are experiencing organization and trying to be those partners to come together and think about the sector as a whole. What are we facing as a sector? How do we uh, solve the problems of the sector? And I, I want to just end my little initial comments by saying that um, staff unionization is clearly a one way to create democracy and clearly an incredible pathway to building resilient organizations, right? If our folks are engaged, 
um, have collective power, and if management and the union understand the partnership that they can create within organizations and collective bargaining, um, our organizations can only get stronger and clearer, and our internal processes and systems, for example, supervision can only get better. Um, and those are the outcomes that we've seen in the best case scenarios, and I think that we'll talk later about what grant makers and funders can do, but we can actually seed um, the resources, the mindset, and the shifts that will really uh, strengthen it and empower um, organizations and see unionization as a pathway towards that um, among many others. So I know Nicole will have much more to say about that. So <laughs> that's great, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, so Nicole, let's bring you into this conversation. It'd be great both as an NFG staff union member, as well as a grant maker for NFG's Amplify Fund. It'd be great to hear your experience. And of course, somebody who's been in the nonprofit sector a long time, how does what you're here, what you heard from Amy and what you've heard from Maurice resonate with you? And what are you seeing and sensing right now in the sector overall? So before I answer that question, I just want to shout out uh, our negotiating our bargaining team, Netta, Stephen, and Amanda, who I saw. There she is in the back right there. Uh, without whom I would not be up here or doing any of this. Um, so I've worked in on profits for, I know I probably don't look like it, but for like a solid 20 years at this point. And I have seen some things. I have a lot of horror stories and a lot of things that I think you all probably know about, about the ways in which we assume that if you are working for a cause, that you are willing to give your whole life, your mental and physical health over to that cause and the way that um, organizations will take advantage of that. So having seen that, having landed at a place like NFG, um, it's fascinating for me and also really affirming. This is the first job that I have had that we have unionized, that there has been any talk of a union, anything like that. And thinking back to all of the things that I saw and all of the things that I dealt with as a nonprofit employee and also as a Black woman, I think that unionizing has incredible potential to address a lot of the issues that we talk about both within philanthropy and also with nonprofits as a whole. Things like burnout, like low wages, like inequity, like the lack of support and lack of mentorship, which again is something that I really felt as a Black woman. Um, that being said, uh, as you all know, NFG itself is in a little bit of a transition moment right now. And I want to be very clear that I have a lot of respect and a lot of empathy, particularly for leaders of color who were put in into an organization who have a staff that unionizes and it feels like it's happening at you. To which my response is always, it's not happening at you. I mean, maybe it is a little bit, but more than likely, you have a staff that is just trying to band together to build power within their organization the same way you are encouraging or at least you should be encouraging all of your grantee partners to build power in their various perspectives right um some of you all were at our eastern north carolina breakout session we have a series of community agreements that we developed with the grantees um we also had them printed on some fans one of them is nothing about us without us is for us. That I think sort of encapsulates, right? The entire, I think my entire perspective on unionizing as a nonprofit worker and in philanthropy, like you can't ask folks to develop and to challenge power structures and then not expect it to sort of come home to roots, right? <laughs> like. That doesn't make any sense. And yet, and yet, that's what ends up happening a lot of times. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is, especially given the pandemic environment that we are in, the transition to remote work, uh, I want to point out the ways in which unionization can advance equity across your organization in different places, right? NFG headquartered in California. I work for NFG. I live in Louisiana. 
don't know if you all are aware of this, but the labor laws and the perspective on labor protections between California and Louisiana are wildly different. But I get that protection both from being a part of an organization that is headquartered in California, but also above and beyond that, I get that protection from the union and you can provide that for your employees, particularly as you switch to a remote environment, like across, across the country. And like, there is some real security in that I can personally tell you, so. I love that. Thank you, Nicole. And actually, I want to put a pin in that last point and come back to it because I'm really interested to explore with all of you how this trend of unionization in this sector um, works in relationship to some of the bigger future of workplace questions that are taking root right now. But before we go there, Maurice, let's bring you back into this conversation. So given what you've heard from what Amy and Nicole have shared, um, and knowing that your article was also a reflection of discussions you've had with many peers in the movement space, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on this question about um, what, what is really happening and to the question that's, I think, relevant to this room, what can philanthropy do? It's a great question. So I, I have a lot of thoughts about this. And I think we just, we have to... So number one, thank you, thank you, because I appreciate that framing. And, I, and your experiences and your work tracks with everything that I, I hear in the field, everything that I experience inside of WFP with other folks. You know, no process is a panacea, right? So unionization can be a tool that could create democratic workplaces and help um, staff, and management arrive at a strategies to be able to make more resilient, more powerful organizations can be, right? Um, and so I don't want us to think that there's any magic bullets, any magic processes, any magic solutions. And also at the core of your organization, if you haven't dealt with the fundamentals, like why do we exist and what do we do? Unionization isn't gonna solve that. Like if you are incoherent before unionization, you'll be incoherent after, right? And um, and the other thing I, I just wanna bring into the room that this stuff is hard, like stuff is hard emotionally. And I wanna like, you know, like I remember when um, our staff union didn't did an action against me and um, and announced that they they wanted to be recognized. That wasn't one of my, that wasn't a happy day for me, right? I was really uncomfortable and, you know, I went through so many emotions as a leader. I was like, man, did I, like, did I fail as a leader? You know, I, I try my level best to create a compassionate and effective workplace and be the boss that I wanted to have when I, and like, what does this mean about me? There's no way that anybody can't personalize it because we're human beings. We're not AI, thank God, yet, right? So, <laughs> so um, there's an, there's a way that we need to surface the the emotional terrain that exists here. And you know, I had a tough week. I talked to folks, I processed it. I eventually came to the understanding that it wasn't about me, that it was about stuff that was much bigger. You know, yeah, did, did I feel some type of way that after 20 years under a, a white male leader with no unionization, the minute I came in, all, all of a sudden people want to talk, yeah, of course. Like, could we like actually have that conversation? Uh, you know, could we talk about the fact that like nonprofit leaders are are not Jeff Bezos, right? And and organizing in these conditions is not the same as organizing under capital uh, against capital in the same ways. And that nonprofit work, like using like a Marxist anal analysis of what the work is and where the profit is coming from, is not the same as as the profit centers in Amazon and other multinational corporations. Yet our workers should be unionized, right? We could have all those, we should surface all those contradictions. We're not surfacing the contradictions, we're not doing our job, right? Um, so saying all that to say, <laughs> um, um, what was the question? <laughs> I love it. You're on such a great roll. Um, no, just, just what, I mean, really just asking you for that experience, but also what you're hearing from your peers, yes. right? And yeah. what should philanthropy okay, do? Okay, okay, great. What should philanthropy do? All right, all right, all right. So what should philanthropy do? 
do no harm. Philanthropy, you all should have a Hippocratic oath of at, at the very least, do no harm, right? And you're gonna, in these disputes, you're gonna have management go to you. You're, you're gonna have the union go to you to be an arbiter. It's not your responsibility, it's not your role, right? And so don't get in the middle of it in a way that is disruptive, right? At, like you're not, you're not playing the role you think you're playing by, by trying to support the executive director you think is getting beaten up on or support the, the union folks as you, you wanna be down with the working, like your job is to create the conditions so that both sides could be able to resolve these, uh, these negotiations in good faith, right? And so that's your job. Does that make sense? The, the other thing I would say is that, that there, all of this is very expensive. So we, we can't invisibilize the cost that it takes for a workplace to unionize, right? And so more general operating, um, you know, actually including the cost of, of having a resilient organization that could go through these processes in a way where they could also do the work. Like this is like, make sure that you are explicitly and um, upfront naming that and, and visibilizing that and surfacing that as a real cost and a real investment that you need to make to your grantees. Does that make sense? That's great, Maurice. I love that. And actually, I want to go back to you, Nicole, as a grant maker. When, let's just the scenario, you have a grantee partner who reaches out to you and says, uh, so this staff unionization is happening. Like from that context, what do you think are is the role of of philanthropy and program officers in that moment? Like what what have you learned from your own experience on this? I could not have asked you to tee up this question any better. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this hasn't happened at Amplify yet. Uh, I do know that there are a few of our grantees that are unionized, but most of our most of the organizations that we work with are very small or very volunteer run. So unionization maybe is not the best means to accomplish whatever it is that they are trying to do. That being said, if someone approaches me and says, hey, we're unionizing, my immediate response is going to be awesome. Fantastic. That is so good. I am so happy for you. Follow-up response, that's not going to affect your funding at all. We are giving you the money regardless. I personally am happy that your staff is unionizing. Amplify Fun thinks that we are giving you a general operating grant. We are providing you with technical assistance and whatever you may ask for. And it is up to you to figure out the best way to utilize those funds. I think that's part of what makes the Amplify Fund so great is that we, our primary operating principle is to listen to the grantees and do what the grantees need us to do. In the same way that that, that unionization and union staffing with nonprofits and philanthropy boils down. It's the same thing at those organizations. You can't expect to build power working for environmental justice in Eastern North Carolina and not expect your employees to try to also build power within their organization. It doesn't make any sense. It's, And I would actually go a little bit farther and say, it's not just do no harm. It's actively foster a relationship with the grantee partners. They should be your partners so that when they come to you and say that, number one, that they will come to you and say that and that you'll know, and that then you can reassure them that this is an environment, this is an organization that supports the work that you do, however you choose to do it. It is not a, it's not for us to say. It's not our job, it's not our responsibility. Frankly, it's not really any of our business. So that's, that's what I would say personally, but. <laughs> no, that's great, Nicole. I appreciate that. And, you know, so I want to, we're going to continue this thread and I just want to put in my moderation role, a little bit of a uh, planting the seeds that we're going to go to some audience questions. So start thinking about questions you might have um, for these amazing people. I and, did remember oh, one more thing. Yeah, please go say. for it. Um, just to also build off of what you said, there's nothing that says that it has to be a contentious process, right? right? Mm -hmm. Even if you maybe feel that your 
staff members are unionizing at you. They are unionizing at you as a representative of a power imbalance, not necessarily at you personally. Although like, maybe they are. And if you are, you <laughs> need to like look into that a little bit. There are many but, different types of leaders. Right, exactly. Yes, and but people also, are reacting it doesn't to. have to be contentious. It doesn't have to Absolutely. be an adversarial relationship. Um, as part of our bargaining unit, we've been really lucky in that it has not been an adversarial relationship, yeah. right? Like we're all actually aiming for the same thing. We're just on two different sides and doing it slightly different ways. It's not an us versus them. There are no heroes. There are no villains. We're all just people trying to do our best. And if you go into it with that assumption, it makes a big difference and how the negotiations themselves actually happen and also how everyone feels about each other once it's done when you still have to yes. work with these people. Well, that's what I wanted to get at actually for a moment because so in full transparency in my former capacity at Jobs at Justice, actually Amy and I were on the management team together um, and the staff had unionized for years. So it's been a unionized organization for, for a long time. And this piece about culture is really important, right? How do you go through a process like this and come out of it with a strong and even stronger culture of trust, engagement, and dialogue and problem solving, like the muscle of problem solving together. And one of the things that we haven't really talked about is the role of boards. And I know like I've, I've, I'm chairing a board right now that's going through this and board members who are saying, I don't actually know and understand this process either. So there's lots of needs coming up. And Amy, I just want to throw it back to you around this question of what philanthropy can be doing right now, but also some of these other threads that have come up around culture, around board, the role of boards, around, you know, just help us understand that texture a little bit more. Yes. And I do think that what makes the process go better around culture and outcomes and what philanthropy can do as partners to organizations are deeply intertwined. Um, I think as you speak to organizations whose staff are unionizing, helping them get into that constructive and proactive and more hopeful and constructive mindset are, is really important. And what I see most is that organizations realize their, their staff are unionizing and the default setting is what do they want? I'm going to try to figure out what I can give them of what they want. And that really is a deeply missed opportunity to figure out what um, are you trying to do to build this organization to be more resilient, more powerful, and more resourced? And how do you see the collective bargaining process and the possibility of partnership with your staff union as one way that you could advance those goals, right? So it is a two-way partnership, a two-way street. So a philanthropy encouraging people to think about the goals of this process um, and how it can strengthen the organization is, is really, really important. The other thing is just normalizing it. Right. So the social sector is being unionized um, and frankly, the cultural sector like museums right, and cultural institutions are being unionized. This is going to happen. And I love hearing Nicole talk about like saying, awesome, that's a good thing. Um, there's also this piece about uh, helping organizational leaders. Uh, think about how can we actually make this a good thing, right? How are we investing in this process? How are we making sure that we are honoring our staff union and not seeing them only as an entity that's making demands, yeah. let alone unrealistic demands upon us, right? Um, the other thing that I just want to lift up is that um, I have a colleague at Cornell, her name is Sally Klingel, and she really said this provocative thing to me once. She said, it would be a tragedy if an entire generation of newer workers, whether they're younger or just new to movement work, turned to unions and collective bargaining and had a horrible experience, right? It's all of our responsibility, um, the responsibility of philanthropy, of partners, of consultants with organizations, organizational leaders, and union members themselves, right? And the unions that are training them to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so it's really, really important. And I think just to say in terms of boards and, um, Unionization is a change management process. It takes a lot of emotional energy. It takes a lot of resources um, and it takes a lot of time. Um, when we interviewed nonprofit leaders about how, what it took to make it all the way through the process of collective bargaining, during the peak times, voluntary recognition, getting ready for bargaining and bargaining, they reported, and this, these are ED, COOs, chief um, uh, HR officers, that it takes uh, 10, 20, 30, sometimes 40% of their time to dedicate to the process. 
it takes an equal amount of time for the staff leaders of the unions and bargaining units who are doing that, right? And so really um, paying attention to the change management component to this and, and supporting people and thinking about all the things that have to shift in the short and long term to have the best outcomes possible. And framing it to the board as a valid process to invest in. That's right. It's something that will make your organization stronger. And something I want to raise. So our experience um, through unionization was actually very, very, very productive. And um, we went through that experience. And then afterwards, I constantly feel calls from other organizations who have questions about how we manage that experience. And to me, that recognizes a gap in the field. So we're trading notes amongst one another. And like, I didn't build a like, you know, field book for it. So, you know, I, we get on the calls and we consult each other, right? About how we could do this in a way that honors our commitment to organized labor and, and our organizational North Star in a way that actually produces a, a more vibrant culture. And I, I couldn't imagine a, a WFP without the union at this point. And I rely on the union leadership in order to, to do everything that we do. It's become immensely va valuable to have all of the structures in place that the, the collective bargaining agreement um, led to. And, but, you know, we shouldn't be piecemeal putting this stuff together, you know, in, in hushed conversations as EDs in order to figure out how to do this right. There's a gap in the, in the field that needs to be filled. Exactly right. And that speaks to the recommendations of the report, right? Well, let's open it up for some questions now from all of you. What are you sitting with as you hear this conversation up here? All right. Oh, oh look at that. Okay. There's a couple of things. Um, one to what was just shared about there being a gap in the field. My question, because I've said this to Marjana Jones, Lyft Fund, we're also fiscally sponsored by NFG, and I'm extremely proud of y'all for putting on this, or this conversation, because it's been hushed like in different corners for too long in this nonprofit sector. So thank you very much for, you know, just putting a light on it. I want to know how funders can help fill that gap either through you know, providing funds directly to NFG or other spaces where you are able to document this process that you all are going through, um, where you're able to share some of the learnings and some of the stories that are coming out of it, because nonprofits are organizing, foundations are also nonprofits, and foundation staffs are organizing, and there's been some horror stories. Um, and people have been pitted against each other as villains Versus like, you know, there's no villains in the story as all of you have been very eloquent about. So I want to know, like, is there a space where that funding could go to just, you know, on top of the general operating support to provide some of that story collection to then disseminate to the rest of us? And the other one is a provocation to what um, Maurice shared is that clarity is key, right? If we're going to fund organizations to get as clear, how are we in our own institutions getting that level of clarity as well, where the program staff is echoing the same mission, the finance folks are echoing the same mission, the lawyers, everyone else is echoing the same mission and figuring out not what you can't do, but how what you can do to get to that place. I feel like that is a huge gap in conversations that we're not having in philanthropy and that we need to, and how do we do that and support one another in that space as well. Wonderful, thank you for that, Marjana. And, and I just wanna say you modeled very well. So this is also being virtually, like we have virtual audience members. And so when you get the mic, if you're asking a question, please speak clearly into the mic so that folks can hear. Um, so terrific questions about how do we document this? Where should we be putting resources? Foundation staff is also organizing. Uh, where do we get the clarity within our own institutions of philanthropy? Where can the funding go? So open, go for it. Well, I just want to say two things. One very specific thing. So we also need to elevate the way that um, race and gender plays into this. In my experience, right, um, and, and, and like, I've been thinking about it and I, like, I just feel like there's archetypes for certain type of leaders. So there's archetypes for the white male leader. 
which is why generally white men are allowed to be absolute assholes. And then we conspire collectively to explain it and be like, well, he's kind of rough around the edges, but he's a genius and a visionary. Whereas like women of color um, could, could be doing the same things. And it's like, she's not a good cultural fit or you know, she's a tyrant or whatever, right? And we don't talk enough about the fact that that is true in our society, it's true. And so how do we deal with it? We pretend that it's not true. And then we congratulate ourselves for elevating women of color to positions. And then we don't invest in the cultural work to support them to do that. So similarly, I just feel like there needs to be with this particular challenge around unionization, a recognition that it is harder with women of color leaders and it requires more investments. And then around like the philanthropy and clarity, yes, Without clarity, philanthropy is just the PR firm of organized capital. So you all have to figure that out. All right. <laughs> Amy, go um, Without again, clarity, philanthropy is just the PR, PR wing to organize capital. Yeah. All right. And in, since we're all organizers too, in relation to organizing resources and money, um, just to say, Marjana, thank you for that question. I just want to be clear um, around the Beyond Neutrality Project that what we hope to do is to do that documentation to, to create the groundwork, the foundation. It will be things like hopefully like podcasts of EDs who have gone through something where people can listen and it's evergreen and in real time, webinars, lots of materials, um, in, lots of interactive spaces. And we intend this to be a short-term uh, resource investment and project that will then be self-sustaining. So we're not creating a new organization that's going to have to be supported forever, but there is this idea of how do we shape and how do we resource the collection of those, um, of those materials, of the learning, the leveraging the expertise experts to help create pro-union and anti-racist materials that will allow organizations, and I mean um, managers and union members, understand how to engage with this process in an innovative and generative way. Um, and so that we will be raising resources to try to shape that and create that and disseminate that. Um, hopefully most of the materials will be for free. The consultant work um, is going to be also subsidized. Um, and so uh, anyone who has an interest in how that's going to move forward in the next couple of years, please see me and uh, my materials obviously in, in Hoover. Right. Great. Fantastic. I'm going to oh, go ahead. Oh, Nicole, I will please. just quickly add that I think that a lot of these conversations are happening, at least on the staff staff level, in my experience. And I don't know what the answer is for how to document that and how to get it like out of the whisper network, yeah. except to make sure that you are cultivating an environment that is pro-union and that where your employees feel comfortable talking about it and bringing it more out in the open. So it doesn't have to be part of like a whisper campaign. That's right. Um, so we'll talk, we, we'll come back to this theme over and over again, but I'll just say in that moment that we, at Ford, we had hosted a briefing actually on the report. And so just to follow up that um, Amy's invitation is really important because a whole set of consultants and training institutes like Rockwood and others are having a really deliberate conversation about how to lean in and support organizations in this moment. So if you are trying to figure out how to resource this work, it's a great entry point, at least to start understanding the full landscape of experts and partners um, that uh, can really help make a difference. So let's go to other questions. So we have another one here. Hi, my name is Gabriela and I am with North Star Fund. Um, as I'm sitting here listening to unionization and building worker power, I can't help but think about uh, worker centers and how we are, you know, we, we often don't highlight that when we're talking about unionization and how worker centers are building worker power in a way that it's not the traditional model when it comes to unions, but you know, rather that they're using popular education models uh, and making demands and bringing about change in that way. Um, so how would you say we can fund and uplift more of that work in talking more about worker centers? Well, I think it's a great question and I just wanna be clear, and this might be helpful for you to lift up, Amy, in your interviews, because actually a number of the worker center networks have their staff has unionized. Um, so we should be clear about that. So maybe you wanna to speak to that and then we can ask the question around the worker center specifically. Um, 
Yeah, so just to say in the interviews um, and also just in the data that's coming out of the field, many, many worker centers, staff members um, are unionizing, as well as many of the organizations, sort of the networks that support worker centers nationally. Um, and it's interesting because some of the challenges that come up in that, those situations are different from the idea of how does your board, for example, support it. It's how does your membership base uh, relate to and support and feel about the staff union, right? Um, and there are a lot of interesting comparisons about the um, working conditions that the leaders and members of worker centers have in their work in the world and the contrast between that and what unionization can offer and accomplish. So those inherent tensions I talked about at the beginning play out in different ways in organizations that have membership bases like that. But it, as Sarita says, it is happening even in those sectors. Um, innovations are happening and some very interesting um, collective bargaining agreements that acknowledge the power sharing that is happening when the union is one force in an organization, but there are also powerful membership bodies that um, are part of how the organization is governed um, is, have to be preserved and honored as well. Yeah, do either of you wanna take say anything more on that question? Around the worker center question? Yeah. I mean, the, I appreciate that provocation. I do think like when we talk, to, talk about labor organizing, we're talking about labor power and organizing workers, we need to have an expansive definition, include worker centers, I think include, you know, other sort of cooperative economic sort of models and co-ops and as well as sort of traditional sort of unions, but the, generally the broad field of, of, of workers organizing and how is philanthropy supporting that, especially at a time like you raised when we're at an all time high of like people recognizing their labor power and organizing around it. And so how is philanthropy looking at it as a whole and not thinking about it narrowly? Yeah, and I would just add to that. So um, I know, my slide says I'm the thematic area director of Future of Workers. I'm no longer, I was the former uh, director of Future of Workers program. And at Ford, we funded a lot of the worker center work. And actually it's been amazing to see the, in, the inroads. I certainly lifted up the labor fights, but just to be clear, everything from essential worker standards boards being created, domestic worker standards boards being created, like lots of really innovative collective bargaining models. And so happy to talk more about that, but this is where I want to lift up Manisha's work with the Funders for a Just Economy and the Lift Fund that Marjana talked about. These are all spaces where those discussions are really taking root. So thank you for the question. Okay, we have a question over here. Hey, Cliff from Black Voters Matter. Um, I just wanted to kind of circle. <laughs> thank you. Just wanted to circle back to the point that all of you have, have addressed, you know, the issue of the racial and gender equity. Um, and I, I, I think as we think about it, that there's, you know, what's the role of race and gender in terms of origins, right? Um, and then what's the race and gender in terms, what's the consequences in terms of impact? So I'm gonna put aside the origins, although I am dying to ask a question about the origins part. Um, I'm gonna just focus on the impact part. Because if we accept, and I think on, on Amy's observations, it said that there are unequal race and gender impacts right i'm trying to merge or you know reconcile that with um you know that the role of philanthropy is to not pick sides not to provide extra support and I'm, so i'm just trying to the question is in what ways can we all recognize that there are disparate impacts right in terms of race and, and, and gender and for both leadership and also for workers organizing right um, but in what ways can we recognize that and be intentional about addressing it um, without it being a matter of picking sides? Because there's there's a lot of universal goods that have unintended consequences, right? Social security is a universal good. It has some racial and gender impacts, right? Healthcare is a is a universal good, but if you're not intentional about the ways that it shows up in terms of race and gender, you miss something, right? And, and not everybody gets the benefit equally from that universal good. So how can we be intentional once we've observed it, Amy? How, how can we be intentional about having observed it, but also figuring out how do we address that? Terrific question. I, I just want to say one thing about picking sides. I do not think it's picking sides for philanthropic partners to support leaders through unionization. I think that that is 
supporting the process, right? And leadership matters. You need to support the leaders of your institutions. That That's not picking sides. I think picking sides, what I'm talking about specifically is when folks are actually asking for, in, in ways that, that I think are really problematic, for help in the negotiation in, in ways, either sides. That's what I'm talking about. But, but no, if philanthropy is going to be helpful, then we need to be supporting these leaders. And it, it's incredibly important for philanthropy to be su support. I'm going to step away from the unionization question, supporting the work of building cultures that will retain and support and not reject the leadership of women of color, right? That is an essential mandate and it's not happening. We're congratulating ourselves because we elevate people. We're falling into the, the trap of narrow essentialist, you know, sort of representational politics. Oh, look how great I am. I, I elevated a woman of color to leadership. It's complete bullshit. It's not helping anybody. It's not helping the person that you elevated. It's not helping the institution. It's not helping the movement. And we should like take a look at ourselves, right? Stop congratulating ourselves by doing surface bullshit and actually create the conditions to actually do the things that we, we wanna do. You wanna challenge white supremacy and patriarchy in a white supremacist and patriarchal culture that's going to be hard. It's going to always be hard. It's gonna require constant vigilance and constant investment. And so, you know, that if that's done, then that leader could be situated to do their job in all areas, including unionization. Amen to that. All right, Nicole. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. It's a, I think it's a hard one to answer because I'm trying to think about how I would answer this both personally and as a, a grant maker with the Amplify Fund. Um, and what immediately came to mind when you said that is we, uh, so as I mentioned, Amplify gives unrestricted gen ops funds. There has been one context in which we have given restricted funds and it was for wellness grants. We gave all of our grantees money and said, you cannot spend this on gen ops. You have to spend it on yourself and your staff and you can do that however you want to. Some folks went to the beach, some folks did therapy co-pays, whatever. Um, and I think a model similar to that is how you help support women of color, leaders of color uh, through the process without necessarily like, you have to be so careful not to put your thumb on the scale in one way or another, because that is a negotiation between that organization and those workers. And it's not our place to say one way or another, like, it's it that's too paternalistic, right? And we have a history of paternalism and philanthropy that really trying to avoid. Um, so I think that the way that you do that is by valuing the support and the help that you can provide financially and otherwise, and and setting those leaders up for success and helping them be able to take care of themselves. Um, I, as I mentioned, I live in New Orleans and after, in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, we had a lot of mutual aid, a lot of things like that happening. And a lot of folks just burning out immediately, myself included, because there was just so much to be done and no support whatsoever beyond like, we have to get folks immediate needs met. And in retrospect now, I have been working with an organization in New Orleans, and one of the things that they are doing is providing caretaking grants for the folks who were doing the work to say, here is, it's almost, I like to think of it as like a little mini MacArthur Genius Grant. Like, here is some money for you to take care of yourself in whatever way you need to. And if you have questions about that, if you need help, if you need technical assistance in that, we got you. We will help you figure it out. And I think that sort of model is the best possible way to set folks up for success as they go through the negotiations and to come at them from a non-combative and uh, a place of feeling supported both financially as an organization, but like also an investment in that particular person and their well-being. Amy. And um, Cliff, thank you so much for this question. It's something I think about a lot. And some a, a seed I want to plant in this room, especially in your role as supporters of all the leaders of nonprofits is there isn't anything that unionization surfaces to be addressed within an organization that didn't exist before unionization. 
right? So unionization doesn't cause those things. Unionization isn't the switch that is the mechanism. It is actually just something that surfaces the conversations that need to happen, the internal practices, beliefs, um, relationships that need to be addressed and the conversations that have to happen around how do we want to move forward together, right? So like uh, the third thing is really the risks that people want to take. So just to say when staff members form a union and you're waiting for collective bargaining, a sort of default setting that comes out of union avoidance is that you can't communicate anymore, right? You can't talk about internal pra practices. You can't solve problems together. You know, you have to wait for collective bargaining. It has to be this other thing. Most of that is actually untrue. Um, and there are very real and thoughtful and um, um, purposeful risks that organizational leaders and union leaders can take to not get trapped into those corners, right, to those adversarial corners. Um, and so I just wanted to say that, like, these disparate impacts can also be addressed by encouraging leaders to think about what are the risks you want to take, what are the conversations you need to have, and how do you actually approach your union in an early labor management relationship, don't wait for a contract, to talk about what's happening and what, what you want to do differently. Fantastic. We have a question over here. Hello, um, Tachi Santos with the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing, and I get nervous on a microphone, so I wrote my question, um, and I'm very curious about your experience um, in a union. Uh, one part, what has being in what has being in a union made possible for you that did not feel possible before? And if you were to go through a union unionization a process again, is there anything you would do differently? Fantastic question. Thank you. Do any of you want to kick it off? Uh, this is where I shout out Renata, who was one of the people who helped us get started organizing at NFG. Um, I really love being in a union. I, I'm not much of a shrinking violet. Uh, <laughs> you see, yeah, <laughs> see the table of my coworkers laughing. Uh, but I really feel like it has made me. I feel like it's made me step into a power in my, into my power in a way that I was not aware of and didn't think that I had. Um, it has also dramatically deepened my co my connections with my colleagues and my coworkers, right? Like, I don't know if y'all have noticed this, but NFG is a pretty collegial place. Like we get along, we have fun, we really like each other. But like when you're kind of, I hate using war metaphor, so I'm not going to say in the trenches, but when you are negotiating and you're going through these things on minute detail and you're spending hours over it, it really helps to have people with you that you like and that you feel like get you and like respect the process that you were going through. Um, so being in a union has made me virulently pro-union now. I am talking about, I won't shut up about it. It's, I, it's really been a, um, to use a TikTokism, a core memory for me. <laughs> well, it's an important point. These people are transformed through the process yes, all the way around, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Which is great. Yes, I see you both wanting to get it. Just quickly, yeah. I mean, I, I, when I think about what we went through as an organization, I can't imagine us going through that transformation without a union. I can't possibly imagine it. And so, Day to day, our union has been so helpful and useful from the standpoint of management, just around wrestling with challenges at a workplace and having a system and a process where we could engage thoughtfully with our core of, of staff leaders on, on how to resolve these really challenging sort of there's, where there's no right answer. It's like, how do we struggle around figuring this out and having a, a team of folks that we could do that? Plus, it's a great leadership development engine because it creates another level of leadership. And so staff are able to like, like you say, grow in, grow in their power and grow in their leadership in ways that make them more effective at doing their job and engaging with us. So it's um, done well, again, no panacea. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience for us. And I think is one of the reasons why even, even though we scaled during the pandemic, we were able to come out of the other side, a stronger organization. Great. As far as I just want to Go say ahead. what we would do differently, I have to get back to you because we are literally in the midst <laughs> of it right now. Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Um, you know, when I was in Missouri, I was uh, I worked for Missouri Jobs with Justice for 10 years. I was an organizer and I helped <laughs> Missouri Jobs with Justice. Yeah. Um, 
I helped form a first staff union and negotiate a first union contract. And it was at a time when a lot of uh, labor related organizations were sort of their staff were organizing on principle, right? So it was very different. I actually literally negotiated a collective bargaining agreement at a board member's house over wine. Just saying, it doesn't go that way anymore, um, but it happened. Um, and But I experienced something that I definitely see in how staff unions are talking about this moment of unionizing nonprofits, which is a real desire to be part of the labor movement, right? And it's meaningful to have people want to be part of and lead and create and grow the next generation of labor leaders. And that's definitely playing out in movement organizations. The other thing, this speaks to the question of what are the advantages of having a union? A union actually gives staff members a real clear sense of belonging and of what it means to think about interests in a collective and out of the out of place of community, right? Um, and it, the best case scenario in movement organizations is that union leaders, the staff members who are part of the bargaining unit feel a strong sense of belonging within their union. And then there is a strong sense of belonging throughout the organization as a staunchly union employer. Right, so we create and foster belonging and that's what people are reaching for. Yeah, and I just wanna take a moment to add that I think a big gain is as somebody who oversaw an organization that went through a merger, it was incredibly helpful to have the staff unionized when you're trying to negotiate a merger or an acquisition. And the second thing is having recently gone through a leadership transition, really helpful to have staff unionized in that process as well. So there's lots of different ways to think about the gains. Um, and also just to say that if I could do something differently, it would be going back to this point, I think Amy, you mentioned earlier and then Mo, you talked, well, actually all three of you talked about this, Nicole, you too, of like there's culture and then there's like, the things like around salaries and benefits and, you know, flex time and comp time and all those things and recognizing that you have an opportunity to create new models and practices and to approach it from that space versus feeling like everything gets solved in this one process. And it took me a long time to learn that. And um, that's my hope for the support we're talking about here that organizations get to that realization quicker and are innovative internally. Um, so we have one last question. Uh -huh. Go last for question. It. Thank you so much for this incredibly helpful panel. I'm Stephanie Greenwood with the Victoria Foundation. We're a local place based funder in Newark, New Jersey. And a lot of the ways staff union conversations have come to us have come from grantees that also do direct service provision. Mm -hmm. And the way the conversation has emerged really challenges the business model um, that the material conditions the workers are trying to bargain over are the near poverty wages that they are experiencing in their nonprofit, basically structured by the philanthropic environment and the government um, aid formulas that are funding their work. And so I guess I wonder about tools for challenging those business models, challenging philanthropy to be reflective about um, building those business models, sector-wide tools for sort of holding that conversation, because uh, we have not found, frankly, a good way to respond. It, it's supportive as we want to be. We are part of that problem at, at my organization to say, well, how are we, how are we going to change our funding approach so that it is no longer the case that people who are providing services are very close to needing those services themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful question. Do you want to? The one thing that I'll share, I think about this a lot too, because I am seeing a lot more social service organizations or direct service providers unionizing. Um, two things I want to share. We all have to remember the context of the, the there was a, a deep privatization of government services that began in the 60s and that culminated with the Reaganomics, right? Where government services were people were get, having union jobs with pensions and benefits, we're providing those services, and then we privatize all of that, right? And so we're still living the legacy of that privatization, and that's the struggle where that was not a structural adjustment that was good for anyone, including the workers and service organizations, right? So just, we also have to remember that context and think about how do we overcome it? And I'll just say one model, this could be a much longer conversation, is, you know, um, public sector workers like the way that school boards and teachers um, with 
the, the public good and common good in mind actually go to voters to try to increase revenues to make sure that we're raising standards and providing good services. What we have to figure out is how to replicate that model so that we are pushing uh, the funding models that are coming both out of government and out of philanthropy for these service organizations and raising the standards of workers, uh, uh, standards for those workers as well as the standards for those services. So I would just say that I think that is the model we have to figure out how to innovate and replicate um, in those areas. I have a lot of feelings about this as a longtime nonprofit worker who is once upon a time in a very similar situation. And what I will say is that this is a room full of funders. This is absolutely something that you can change. This can stop tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is absolutely no reason why you can't be giving more money, why you can't be giving money with less restrictions, why you can't be making things easier for your grantee partners, right? that it's it the people in this room can fix that right now and it's about pressuring yourselves your organizations and each other to do that like there is literally no reason why it has to be like that um i understand that we are operating in a paternalistic and a white capitalist context but like the reason why you all are here is to challenge that and change that and this is one of the quickest fastest best most immediate ways that you can do that if you value your partners your grantee partners give them more money have less say how they spend it and let them figure out what works best for them Thank I will you. also add that is something that uh, we at the Amplify Fund are very, 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 very uh, interested in helping you all organize around. All right. So I'm going to say a couple of things and I'm warning you, we're going to the speed round. This is the like one minute, whatever you have to end with. So just to say um, that these questions about the networks and whatnot, I mean, a part of why it, I think NFG decided to host this conversation here is for you all to figure out how much of this space can be a space where you're getting the kind of peer support and thinking and learning. Um, and as Amy mentioned before, around some of the labor management networks and other spaces, that those are other places that are trying to get created as well. So I think there's this is just the beginning of what we understand will be ongoing conversations, and you can organize the kind of spaces you need for that. With that, let's go to our, our speed round. So what if, what what was is something you want to emphasize or something you didn't feel like you got to say that you want to make sure you're leaving people with? Would you like to I'm gonna go off? first because I don't want to have the last word. And I think Maurice, <laughs> you are the right one to have the last word. Um I want to say that I hope folks in this room, having heard all of this, are in a place of imagining of imagining what a world looks like when our belief in uh, the labor movement, our belief in unionization and collective bargaining is a reality. Um, and when we actually can grow and change the model of unionization so that we're not stuck in this adversarial us versus them that was really, was, was created for real reasons out of um, more than a century of organizing against capital, right? And we have a place where there's literally a more liberatory process um, and a process that is more inclusive that actually creates entirely different pathways to more democratic organizations. I think it's entirely possible. It's better now than it was three years ago, and it's going to be incredibly better in three years. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Nicole? I would say don't be scared. It's an opportunity. It's not necessary. It might be challenging, but it's not a challenge. Don't be scared. And... Uh, Trust your employees and trust the culture that hopefully you have been building. And that goes from or your organization as well as the organizations that you support. Fabulous. Mo. I'll say two things. I'm in a room of insanely, it's an insanely powerful room. You have access to a lot of power. You have access to a lot of wealth and capital. Um, don't walk away from or be ambiguous about your power. You are protagonists seize that power in a moment look like i come from a people that have been starved and deprived of power for generations i i feel no ways about being power hungry when i've been power starved so what is your responsibility with that power and then the last thing and i think we have a a, a very clear responsibility in times that are not ethically unclear right um the second thing is and 
this is a big part of the my writing how are we centering joy in all this like we talked about like the struggles and the trudgery of getting through like organize how are we centering joy our side is the side of joy and culture and our dreams and vision how are we centering that in our organizations how are we centering that in our struggles how are you as philanthropist philanthropist thinking through every single thing that you're doing and all the ways that you're engaging your 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 grantees and centering that in the joy of our people right power and joy that uncomfortable bounding of power and joy can unlock our liberation. That is a beautiful way to close this out. Please join me in thanking our amazing panel here. Thank you, Amy, Nicole, and Maurice. Thank you for the amazing audience question. And a huge thanks again to NFG for hosting this conversation. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sarita, Maurice, Nicole, and Amy. Um, introducing myself for the final time, I'm Courtney Benayad. I use she, her pronouns. I'm NFG's Director of Membership and Communications and your 2023 National Convening Co-Lead. I have four announcements before we move to close out this incredible National Convening. One is slides for yesterday's funder organizing training are now in your inbox and available on the Whova app. Permissions have been updated so that you can view and share them. Uh, two, so many people connected at the Cameron Art Museum last night and Netta and I had a ton of fun as your MCs. Um, I wanna announce the winners from our bingo activity, which we've also just done via Whova. They are Shara from the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, Brichet at Brichet at the Wellspring Philanthropic Fund and Anaris at Z Smith Reynolds. You can pick up your prizes. You can pick up your prizes before 1.30 at the registration desk, which is right or is outside to your left. Um, third, the link to the convening evaluation survey is live, also in your inbox, also in the Whova app. It's brief and we really, really wanna hear from you. And also it will make my convening co-lead Elizabeth very happy if you complete it. And I like to bring joy to my teammates. Um, so thank you in advance for doing that survey. And then after our closing commentary, lunch will be, out, be available outside, right outside these doors. It's all grab and go. You can take it to the patio. You can take it next door to Merrick Room to eat, enjoy, and then I just have immense gratitude to all of you in the room for your participation, your brilliance, your joy that you shared with us this week. I look forward to staying in community with you. And it's now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage, Tanya, Shai, Kaberi, and Judith. Everybody. Really great to see everyone here. I'm Judith Bell, I'm the Chief Impact Officer at the San Francisco Foundation, and I'm also the Secretary on the NFG Board. And I just wanted to uh, tell a quick story because I think it's so appropriate for now, which is, you know, I found M NFG right after I came to philanthropy. I went to the Oakland Conference and I, um, I had this feeling of deep connection and I thought, okay, I can work in philanthropy, it's gonna be okay because I found uh, a home. And so I just wanted to say that it's been wonderful to be here together and to feel that again, that sense of connection and that sense of being home. And I hope all of you have had that feeling as well. Um, I'm just gonna, or we're just using these, okay. Um, I'm Kaveri Banerjee Murthy, she, her, hers. Um, I'm at the Conrad Prebus Foundation and co-chair with Tanya. Um, and I have I'm been on the NFG board since 2021, I believe. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Tanya Duran. Uh, you see her pronouns. I'm with the Mary Reynolds Backup Foundation, and I'm a co-chair um, with Shai of the Planning Committee, and also a co-chair with Kaveri with uh, of the board. 
And then, hi, I'm Cheyenne Tate Jones, she, her, hers pronouns of the Calibri Foundation and also of the Cypress Fund, co-chairing the conference with Tanya, my favorite buddy, and uh, just want to celebrate how much joy and connection and deep conversations have happened over the last few days. Uh, yeah. Um, and as we close out, we wanted to be able to share a highlight that we're taking away, as I think everyone will be on flights or cars or travel of some sort reflecting on what we've been able to learn and connect on over the last few days um, and hopefully being able to think about how we can talk about this work as we re-engage in the world outside of this wonderful space together. For me, um, and I figured there'd be some knowledge dropped at this panel, so I kind of waited for my, um, to be able to pick mine up here, um, although there was so much wisdom throughout the course of the last few days. Um, I'm walking away with leaders tolerating strategic incoherence as us leaving power on the table. Um, I think there is so much for us to really be able to think and reflect on um, in terms of making sure that we are investing in the clarity and also investing in the culture. Um, and I really appreciated Mo being such an amazing ally to women of color in terms of lifting up what it looks like to invest in the culture work to support women of color as leaders. Well, for me, as other ones have shared, uh, this convening has sparked a lot of very deep, honest, uh, and timely conversations, such as the importance of deepening our collective understanding about racialized capitalism as we navigate philanthropy and its tensions, and also the urgency of addressing the uneven labor and risk-taking that Black women and women of color keep taking in the movement and in the sector as well. Um, so these times ask us, as Maurice was reminding us, for very, very courageous conversations so we can have them in real way and act on them. Um, and as we know, philanthropy can really have a contribution to deep transformational change. And at the same time, if we're not careful, philanthropy can neutralize deep change. And it has done it in the past, and we have that danger to do it in, in the future. Um, and yeah, I, I just an invitation for me, and I'm accountable, I have here my boss, <laughs> to keep pushing for these conversations internally in our, in our institutions, um, because it's in these conversations where we can expand the parameters of what think is possible, especially in times of intersecting crises like the ones we're living in now. I am happy to go next. So I, when I think about what's happened over the last few days, I heard a real call about people and power from our first session where we heard folks call in their ancestors' names to this room, where folks shared really vulnerably about what does it mean to live in what some people would call forgotten cancer country, right? Hearing folks really say that there's something for us to do here and that there is a power when people coming together to listening in the participatory grant making session about what giving projects do to empower and shift who sees themselves as a donor, but also who gets to see themselves as a grant maker to the conversations that happen in between around how we're gathering and galvanizing for sex workers. And what does it mean to expand our conversations about who is a worker and how do we as philanthropy move away from the conservative neo-Christian ideals that ground our organizations and instead say if our mandate was about our people, if our mandate is about our power, how are we opening up conversations so that organizations like Third Wave and their sex workers uh, organizing circle have more space to fundraise, more resources to gather um, to the ways that we had joy and danced and laughed, right? So for me, I think there's this theme of when we're with each other, we are so much more powerful and who we have not had in this room, how do we get them there? That was beautiful, really beautiful, thank you. Uh, I would just echo the themes around organizing and power. And I was very taken by um, Maurice's statement about recognizing the power we have and then using it in the context of all the different themes we've heard today, both about the ways we listen, the ways we engage, the ways we work with partners, the ways we self-reflect and the ways we take responsibility for ourselves, for being allies. I heard that loud and clear yesterday in the conversation. I've heard it over and over. And the ways that I think we can envision uh, what it means to work together uh, and what it means to work with our partners to get to the 
the future that we are holding uh, in our values and in our dreams to make that a reality uh, and to feel the joy in the work and the joy in working together and to uh, experience the joy both in the spaces in the work and to give ourselves the spaces outside of the work to also experience joy. So I wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna thank you all for being a part of NFG. I wanna encourage you all to stay connected in the many different ways that you can. And uh, wanna just wish you all uh, good travels on your way home or to wherever you're heading next. Um, and, oh, sorry, we're not done yet. Sorry, we're not sorry. Done sorry. Yet. Um, so sorry. as we wrap, uh, we wanna make sure that you fill out your brief evaluation in the WUVA app. Wova, I still can't pronounce it, people, app. Um, and we'll also send you an email from NFG that um, will sh share the same survey. If you haven't filled it out, you will get more than one chance. Um, to the funders in the room, I would be remiss if you are not yet an NFG member, please talk to Amy, Courtney, Lauren, or anyone on the NFG staff about becoming a member. Your membership dues support NFG to deliver incredible programming and political education for philanthropy and within philanthropy. And before we all head home from this beautiful gathering here in Wilmington, I also want to do a final round of appreciation Thank you to NFG staff and board members, in particular to Courtney Vanayat, Elizabeth Fan, and Manisha Vazze, who led the team in planning and preparing for this convening. <laughs> and, and, and also to the Amplify Fund, Mel Melanie Baker, Renata Peralta, and Nicole Washington. They were very, very critical and crucial to help us have uh, ensuring that Amplify Eastern North Carolina grantee partners were well represented in the planning and also in the program. Also, thank you to Ms. Risa Willis and also Lamisha Whittington. Who, yes. Who, who have helped us uh, to feel connected to Wilmington, grant us in the history, and fa facilitated so much learning during our time here. Ms. Risa, to you especially for the incredibly warm welcome to your home. And, and also thank you to all the 16 of our um, Amplified Grantee partners who have inspired us with their power building and equitable development work in Eastern North Carolina. We also wanna extend big thank yous to the Girl Friday team who managed all, who managed all of the emails, especially from me, small <laughs> and big ads, um, to really help to make sure that this thing come together. Thank you to the Hotel Ballast staff for taking such good care of us this week. both from the housekeepers, the servers, front desk staff, AV techs, and on and on. We would not have been able to do this without you. And if you still have a room, please tip your housekeeping staff. It is important. Thank you to our many convening sponsors and to all of your foundations who've needed resources to make sure that we're all able to be here and to make those convening grants. And then finally, thank you to all NFG members in this room who keep pushing us uh, to keep uh, philanthropy more accountable to BIPOC and low income communities and fostering a political home that so many of us get to engage in here together. And our last thank you today is to Tanya and Shai, our incredible convening co-chairs. We are, we are so grateful for your leadership and brilliance. I'm going to let this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We are so grateful for your leadership and brilliance, your unwavering excitement through all of the twists and turns of convening planning, including our pivot from 2022 to 2023, <laughs> shaping our analysis full of plenaries and strategy sessions, making introductions and inviting so many folks to join us here in Wilmington. And I will let Judith now just say thank you so very much for everything and to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you for being here and safe travels. <laughs>